ko te wai e hore nei, wai te mata, ko te mara e takotora, ko wai papa, ko koto a ko rangatira, tena koto, tena koto, tena tatu katoa. Well, New Zealand is located at the heart of the world's largest ocean, and more than anything else, this shapes our identity as a country. As many of you will know, about 85 million years ago, New Zealand floated away from Gondwana land, evolving in isolation with its plants and animals. Jared Diamonds described New Zealand as the world's smallest continent or the world's largest islands. Like the first Polynesian voyages, the first Western explorers to arrive in New Zealand, Abel Tasman and Captain James Cook, faced formidable challenges. In order to cross the Pacific and reach these remote islands, European mariners had to perfect the art of sailing over very long distances and technologies that enabled them to survive challenges from island warriors. So in 1769, when Endeavour made its landfall on the east coast of New Zealand, the scientists on board from the Royal Society thought that they had discovered Terra Australis Incognita, the great unknown southern continent that people have been looking for uh, for many hundreds of years in Europe. Fabled to be rich in gold and silver and pearls, and with Rajas riding around on elephants, and riding around on elephants. And instead what they discovered was my hometown of Gisborne. And from New Zealand, across the Pacific, and to Europe. I guess that's what happens when you spend your academic career uh, studying people who've spent a lot of time trying to discover what's across the horizon. And in addition, I've been really fortunate to have a deep exposure to Māori knowledge and ways of understanding the world with elders like Eduardo Sterling, uh, Mary Mary Penfold and many others over the years, and my colleagues in Māori studies. So now I'm engaged in what I would call experiments across worlds. What happens and what has happened in New Zealand and elsewhere in the Pacific as people with very different ideas about how reality works have come together and try to negotiate shared ways of living. So that's kind of where I locate myself and have done, for, I guess, for a long time. And I think I'm really fortunate to work as an anthropologist in my own country and in the Pacific region. There's never, never a dull moment. In anthropology, I guess, we take it for granted that as people ourselves, there's no external position, no pure position, from which we can observe the lives of others, or indeed life in general, or indeed the world in general. You know, we are located by our, who we are as people and our historical and cultural contexts. There's no getting out of it, despite our pretensions to the contrary at times. Because my interest in this whole area of voyaging began uh, with trying to understand the very first encounters between Māori and Europeans, and that took me to look at Tasman and then Cook and then other explorers like Marion Dufresne and so on. And then it extended out into the Pacific to Tahiti. So I spent quite a bit of time in Tahiti as well. And in the course of that exploration of voyaging, it was ex the thing that was so extraordinary about it was um, trying to understand what was happening on the beaches and inside the kāinga and inside the pā uh, when the first Europeans arrived in different parts of, of Aotearoa but also in, the, in places like Tahiti. And in the course of doing that, I met up um, with some of the great voyagers. So I had the privilege of meeting Herb Kane, who helped to set up the Polynesian Voyaging Society and build the Hokulea um, very early on when we were, I was thinking about uh, what happened in Kealakakua Bay with the death of Cook and met up with Herb. He grew, in the, grew up in the bay next door and um, wandering around that bay with him. And we were reconstructing what had happened as we were in the landscape. The story seemed to just come out of the land and out of the ocean. We were looking at the, at the actual pl place where the priest's house stood and where the priest had their pools and so on. And it was extraordinary experience wandering for a couple of days around that bay with Herb. Um, and then I met fortuitously Mo Piolog, who trained Jack and um, Hotu and many others. Met him in Hawaii as well, actually, um, and was invited to go and see him. And he was about to set off to Yap uh, from, yeah, he was about to cross from Hawaii, the big island, all the way over to Micronesia with a, a, quite a young crew. 
And what an extraordinary guy. He was just so, the main anxiety he had was the escort yacht. They made him have an escort yacht and it had, motor, had, pro had problems with his motor and he was missing his good wind because of the problems with the escort yacht. The only thing that I would um, add uh, is some, uh, the references that Sir James used to often give to Hawaii. He always referred to Hawaii as two places interacting. There's the Hawaii of the spiritual world. There's the Hawaii of the material world. And uh, he often, in his talk, would refer to both. And uh, he was to instruct a lot of us young ones then uh, to always refer to Hawaii. Uh, and, and behind the word Hawaii is a whole history that, uh, that, that points to why Māori are here, why Samoans are here, and why what we call Polynesians are here. Hmm. So um, one of the things that I learned when I was working in Tahiti was that um, the old name of Ra'iatea um, is, it refers to Hawaii. So, and so when um, I was trying to understand the role of Tupaya in the voyage and going to Taputapuatea, so I got very involved with people who were fighting to have Taputapuatea recognized as a, a world heritage site. And there is